Stay hungry. Stay foolish. I have such an amazing episode in store for you today. The purpose of this show is to bring you what's called alternative analysis, information that is hard to find anywhere else. And it is with distinct pleasure that I bring you this information every week. Thank you for joining us every week. Thank you for all your brilliant feedback. It's always very welcome. If you do have time, please leave a review on iTunes. It really helps the show get in front of some more ears. It is with thanks to our sponsor, Zai, that it can bring you even more content and with more pleasure than ever before. Zai is boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded finance products and services, empowering businesses to manage multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease. You can check out Zai at hellozai.com. Today's episode is essential content for business leaders and policymakers. It's an investigation into red teaming, the practice of inhabiting the perspective of potential competitors to gain a strategic advantage. The concept is as old as the devil's advocate itself, the 11th century Vatican official charged with discrediting candidates for sainthood. Today, red teams are used widely in both the private and the public sector by those individuals seeking to better understand the interests, the intentions, and the capabilities of institutional rivals. In the right circumstances, red teams can yield impressive results, giving businesses an edge over their competition, poking holes in vital intelligence estimates and troubleshooting dangerous military missions long before boots are on the ground. But not all red teams are created equal. Indeed, some cause more problems and damage than they prevent. Drawing on a fascinating range of case studies, today's book shows not only how to create and empower red teams, but also what to do with the information that they produce. It is a great pleasure to welcome the author of Red Team, How to Succeed by Thinking Like the Enemy, Micah Zenko. Welcome to the show. Thank you for the opportunity. Glad to be here. Glad to talk about red teaming, talk about innovation, talk about change. It is such a fascinating book. I absolutely loved it. I was telling you before we came on air, how I saw it through the lens of change makers within an organization, the red teams coming into organizations and the way they oftentimes get ostracized, or don't get the full buy in or try to be manipulated in some way is so like what happens with innovators within organizations. But I'm going to get straight into the content. And I'm going to try and follow the arc of the book as much as possible. I love the way you have given us a topology and a way of thinking about red teams but also the way you track the history of this, not the history so much of red teaming, but the history of somebody who calls BS, someone who calls out when things aren't going the right way, or maybe we're grading our own homework as you talk about. And I'm going to start you off with a quote here, where you talk about the concept of devil's advocate. You said, within the Roman Catholic Church, the formal title was prom promoter fidei, or promoter of the faith. More commonly, the position became known in the church and the laity as advocatus diaboli, the devil's advocate. Today, the term applies to anyone who is a skeptic or takes an unpopular or contrary position in the sake of argument alone. A professor who provokes a discussion by countering students' assumption a trial attorney attempting to predict a, an opposing counsel's arguments, or simply a crank, all might be branded as devil's advocate. I thought that would be a way to tee you up and prime the pump to take us through the history of this magnificent term. Yeah, I mean, when I first started writing this book, and I had been collecting information on red team, and red teamers for about 10 years, I'd interviewed hundreds of people. And I finally had the opportunity to dive in and write the book. There was no existing field or definitions or, as you said, sort of topology or typology for what consisted of it. So that was the most fun, which is really starting from ground zero. It's wet clay. What, how are you going to put a sort of tent over the circus of the field of red teaming? And the one example that sort of kept coming back to me was this, uh, the example of the devil's advocate. You know, the devil's advocate is something that we all know about. It's the contrarian by design. And I became just obsessed with the 
um, actual history of this position. By the way, there is no good English language book about the history of the devil's advocate. If anyone is listening to this and wants to write the book, I'll buy the first copy. So we had to go back and look at uh, uh, Italian language and Latin language stuff to try to understand what the history of it was. But as you know, like in the earliest days of the church, being a saint was a prominent position in local communities. And so local communities were always putting forth people as saints. They basically, the local um, bishop could decide somebody was a saint. They were a, had committed alleged miracles. They were proficient members of the faith. They became a saint. Um, in the 14th century, Pope Gregory IX said, and part of larger Vatican centralization said, this is all going to come under our umbrella. We are going to control the process. We decide who becomes saints and the power associated with it. So they created what was essentially a trial-like position. They had individuals who went to local communities, interviewed people to, to determine if they had committed miracles, if they were especially proficient uh, members of the faith. And then they created an alternative position, which was the devil's advocate. That person was designed to do nothing but find disconfirming information. So this person in a trial setting in the Vatican would not um, be accepted for sainthood. And these trials, because they would have information and contrary information in the 14th, 15th, 16th century, they lasted decades. Some of them lasted over a century. Um, and so you had this position, which in 1983 was eliminated. Uh, and it's a, it has a different format. There still is sort of a trial. Instead of needing two miracles, you only need one now. And the bottom line is, in the last 25 years, there were more people who became saints in the church than in the previous 1900. And the lesson is that the institutional check, this contrarian pressure, was eliminated. And subsequently, there's been this sort of huge influx of saints, which some people call the, the Vatican a saint-making factory. So the position in some people's minds has been devalued because the barrier for entry is so much lower. I love the concept because you say it was like the first instance of regular red teaming, looking for the chinks in the armor, looking for the weaknesses. But I thought then on the flip side that the way you articulate it so well in the book is like Aiden wants to be a saint and I just tell all my neighbors here, tell the local priest that Aiden's great and I turn the water into the wine there and then everybody get on the same page and then the priest goes, is this true that Aiden do this? And all of a sudden, I'm a saint and Saint Aiden, it really devalues actually <laughs> the saints of that period uh, for some way. So anyway, I, I just loved how you did that. But I wanted to use that as a way to go. That person is often ostracized and it's a difficult role to have before we start to go build the idea of red teaming further. You know this well in the work that you do, that those people in organizations who speak up against power who decide actually this is not the right course of action, who decide maybe the business model is failing, whatever it might be, often get ostracized, just like I'm sure the devil's advocate was very criticized. It was a hard role to hold. Yeah, people, I mean, a strategy, a plan, a process, by definition, has a lot of power behind it. It doesn't emerge to the point of final decision, final pushing out the door without having a lot of people's identities poured into it, the culture of the organization has started to rally behind it. And once something becomes, as it becomes more and more fully formed, just before it goes to market, you have people, um, it's so hard to challenge it at that stage, right? So it's very important, you know, if you're going to be this sort of voice to do it earlier, we all know people in our organizations who are mavericks. Everyone who works, everyone knows one or two people who routinely say things that other people won't, who identify opportunities, challenge the boss. But in most organizations, mavericks get hunted down and killed, or they get shunted so far to the side that their voice is diminished and is no longer heard by people who can do something with that information. And that's just because leaders care about protecting their perceived authority, their perceived power. Um, people don't wanna hear these opinions and these viewpoints we care about the impressions we make upon each other. We spend a third of our lives either at work or thinking about work. And so we learn to refrain from being those uh, individuals. And then those individuals themselves, as rare they are, tend to get shunted to the side. So I, I wanted to give our audience a flavor of how this plays out 
in critical situations, not to dismiss that business is a critical situation because it many people's livelihoods depend on the survival and thriving of organizations. But actually, when it comes to national security and preventing the outbreak of war, red teaming is absolutely essential. And you give a classic example of red teaming in action, having outsiders test the validity of the intelligence and consider the possibility of alternate hypotheses. This is the story of Bush and Syria. Yeah, so you remember in 2003, the United States led a uh, coalition to invade and topple the regime of Saddam Hussein based primarily on the belief, the widely held belief that Saddam Hussein both had a prohibited weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missile program, and that he, he hid that. He intentionally hid that because he knew that he would be uh, challenged by the international system, but it existed. That was a widely held assumption, a statement taken as true or certain to happen by the United States. In 2005, the Israeli government comes to the Bush White House with photographs of what looks like a facility being built in the middle of the desert in Syria in a place called Al-Kibar, which looks a lot like a graphite moderated nuclear reactor, which we know from the signature from Yongbyon in North Korea. And we know North Korea and Syria trades in missiles and trades in prohibited weapons of uh, mass destruction programs. So at the time, the um, Israelis actually asked the United States to strike the Syrian facility. They didn't want to be implicated with it. Um, the Bush administration decides we're going to review all of our own intelligence. Thank you for the tip off, Israel, but we're going to look on our own. Uh, Michael Hayden, who was the director of national intelligence at the time, he basically commissioned two independent red teams to assess the validity of the underlying intelligence that this was a nuclear weapons facility or I should say a, a nuclear reactor facility that could make the plutonium that would then be used to make a bomb. The one group was basically given all the intelligence and they were told, prove to me that this is a nuclear facility. And they had internal photographs of North Koreans literally working at the factory. They had all the overhead. They knew um, that this was near um, rivers that are cooling plants to allow you to have a nuclear facility. So they know what this looks like from the sky, from the signals intelligence and the energy signature, and they determine it's a nuclear reactor. The other red team, though, Hayden said, I want you to prove to me that this is not a nuclear reactor. I want you to make the strongest possible case that what we are looking at is something else. Um, and I interviewed Hayden, I interviewed um, uh, Steve Hadley, National Security Advisor, I interviewed the Secretary of Defense, Bob Gates. And it was very interesting in this other group, they basically came to the conclusion that the only thing this could be was a fake nuclear reactor that um, Bashar al-Assad had created with the intent of looking like a nuclear reactor for the purposes of either prestige or power, or for some reason he wanted to elicit an airstrike by Israel or the United States against this reactor. And at the conclusion of it, they decided this was implausible uh, hypothesis. And in the Bush White House, they decide, in fact, this is a nuclear reactor, there can be no other uh, basis for it. In the end, the United States decided not to strike the reactor. The Israelis did it um, as well. Uh, the US had a little heads up and maybe a little gave a little support. But it's a great example of having people who had not been read in on the intelligence, who had no preconceived notion or bias of what they were looking at. And they were tasked through structure and facilitation by thinking about this problem differently. Um, and led to a more fulsome and complete picture for the decision makers. It's brilliant. And it, it shows, and we'll talk about it in a second, the cognitive shortcomings that we all have, and that we should admit we have, and that, therefore, we need neurodiversity that comes from red teams, people who have different information or no information at all. I wanted to jump, Micah, to organizations, and then would come to the cognitive shortcomings, because here, you tell us why organizations fail, but can't know they're going to fail, or else they don't want to know they're going to fail. As Upton Sinclair said, trying to describe information to somebody who doesn't want to hear that information, they'll pretend they don't understand it. You say here, the dilemma for any institution operating in a competitive environment characterized by incomplete information and rapid change is how to determine when its standard processes and strategies are resulting in a suboptimal outcome, or more seriously, 
leading to a potential catastrophe. Even worse, if the methods an institution uses to process corrective information are themselves flawed, they can become the ultimate cause of failure. This inherent problem leads to the central theme of your book, you cannot grade your own homework. Firstly, that phrase, absolutely brilliant, sticks in the brain and should be a poster on every CEO, every leader's walls in their office. Yeah, I, it, it's if you. It's, I always say, like, if you asked me how smart, how attractive, how charismatic I am, you shouldn't believe me. And similarly, if you ask the person who writes the plan, who has developed the strategy, who is thinking about an M and A um, decision, like they they fall in love with the potential acquisition, they fall in love with their plan, they fall in love with their strategy. It's not because they don't want things to go well. They're not like saboteurs in your organization. They simply become so invested in its outcome that they are un incapable of sort of standing outside of it and validly assessing and evaluating on its own. You have become part of the plan, the process, the product, the acquisition choice. You can't see it differently. It's similar in all organizations. You know, you think about bureaucracy, process, structure. These are sort of dirty words. I always say the alternative is go to your job every day and start with no structure, like decide that morning what to do you would get nothing done. Structure and process and frameworks are actually very helpful. They simplify the way that we interact. They set expectations. They create normal channels for information flow and decision-making. The problem is over time, these become routinized and they stop becoming practical and sort of tailored to the needs of a current strategic choice or consequential decision. And we just follow them blindly. You know, we have, there's the Phrase the phrase a Stonehenge meeting. We have Stonehenge meetings, Stonehenge processes. These are things that were created in the ancient distant past. We don't really know why, but they persist to this very day. And most organizations assiduously adhere to their Stonehenge processes, meetings, and frameworks without really thinking about it in a different way. And so both the sort of pressures of organizations to um, be incapable of seeing things differently but also the inherent nature of structure, process, and framework that solidifies and calcifies the steps that we go through, again, to make judgments and decisions, make it just inherently impossible to grade your own homework. It's a brilliant line that really, really sticks with you. And I wanted to build on it because I mentioned earlier on the cognitive shortcuts or co cognitive shortcomings that we all have that we should admit we have and that we do need outside help. And this is where the red teams come in. But you talk particularly about in organizations, the organizational biases, because we pick up all these things often subconsciously from the environment, from the way the leaders act for those people who are responsible for our succession throughout an organization, we inherit their way of thinking. And we learn not to stray beyond our swim lane in many ways. But you say here, over a century ago, the brilliant economist and sociologist Thorstein Veblen illustrated how our minds become shaped and narrowed by our daily occupations. What men can do easily is what they do habitually, to your point, and this decides what they can think and know easily. They feel at home in a range of ideas which is, is familiar through their everyday line of action. A habitual line of action constitutes a habitual line of thought and gives the point of view from which facts and events are apprehended and reduced to a body of knowledge. What is consistent with the habitual course of action is consistent with the habitual line of thought and gives the definitive ground of knowledge as well as the conventional standard of complacency or approval in any community. Absolutely brilliant to streamline us towards these cognitive shortcomings, but also the organi organizational biases that we're all subject to. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Veblen. He grew up in um, southern Wisconsin, the state I was born and raised in. He was a University of Chicago uh, economics professor. What Veblen's talking about at that time is the basically the late 19th century. You had about two thirds of the American workforce came out of craft and artisanal practices or farms, and then they came into working in basically manufacturing um, and processing sort of uh, facilities. And as you know from uh, uh, Frederick Taylor and all the other people, the whole point of processes and manufacturing was to have discrete measurable tasks that required no thinking. 
you know, if you've ever done farm work or if you ever worked with your hands in a craft or artisanal practice, what you do every day is different. Like it depends on the weather. It depends on the crop rotation. It depends on whether your equipment's broken. It depends on the product order. But like Taylor, you know, you remember his book, The Principle of Scientific Management. He's literally talking about moving pig iron from one place to another, the most brute routine task you can imagine. It literally requires no thinking. And that's the thing that Veblen worried about is you essentially de-skilled the workforce of the people he was studying. You took away their requirement for critical thinking day in, day out, and reduced it to simply measurable, repeatable tasks that people would follow. And that is what most of us do. When we, I always say, nobody goes to work each morning and decides then and there what to do. We have norms, we have culture, we have rituals, we have expectations, we have a series of processes that over time implicitly shape our ability to see things differently. We literally come into work. And if you remember in the days before COVID, you would walk into an office and your role changes. Your way of thinking changes quite quickly. And then there are all the pathologies that follow this, which we can talk about more in detail, specifically groupthink and the other related cultural phenomena. And you say, for example, the more hierarchical the organization, like the military, or if it's a legacy organization, so most organizations that face disruption are established, they've an established way of thinking, there's a, a pattern, as you say, m many of the, the habits, the organizational habits have been passed on from generation to generation. And oftentimes, we follow these rituals that we don't even know why they exist in the first place. And therein lies the pathology. And it takes somebody a devil's advocate type person to call them out. But oftentimes, that doesn't end well for the devil's advocate. No, and it's interesting because to your point, most leaders, they most leaders in hierarchical organizations don't think they have rigid hierarchical organizations. I mean, the military, they do, they have command and control. There's a reason for it. But most leaders think that people are open and willing to share disconfirming information, new ideas, new opportunities. They think that they empower workers at the front line to come back with what they're seeing in the marketplace, what they're seeing with their customers, what they're seeing with their suppliers. We know from lots and lots of research that people actively suppress their views and their voice, in part because they think they can be retaliated against or punished. But for the most part, in most organizations, people think it's pointless. They learn over time that voicing up, dissenting and challenging viewpoints doesn't go well. And what they do is worse, which is what the business academics call voice sideways, which is also gossip. They basically tell people who can't do anything with useful information what they're experiencing. It sits there, frustration, detachment, disengagement um, um, sort of engenders itself in a workforce. And the leader thinks they know what's going on. They think they have a degree of omniscience in their organization, in their larger situational environment, and they often don't. So that individual who breaks through, who provides information in a pro-social positive way but it's also disconfirming and challenging. Um, if that leader uh, doesn't want to hear that and that's signaled to the broader organization, that leader doesn't get that information more than a couple of times. And it's interesting that when you think about what's on the line here, like in the military, it's lives. And in organizations, oftentimes people make it to the top of the organization based on the way an industry used to be. So they have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo, whether they want to admit that or not. The other thing is, if you're a leader, by the time you've reached that level, by design, you must have been doing something right. So they come into leadership C-suite positions, usually with high degrees of overconfidence and a strong belief in their ability to make sound judgments and decisions. They wouldn't be there if they weren't awesome. And they take that sense of self-endowed awesomeness into their roles and they and they project it onto their workforce and they make it more difficult and challenging to see things through independent eyes. And again, to your point, one of the things I, I noticed from interviewing the best minds like yourself, great authors, is there's a humility and the humil in the humility is the opportunity to learn. It's like the Dunning-Kruger effect. The more you know, the more you know what you don't know. And also, the opposite happens in organizations. And I have great empathy for those people 
who run organizations who are just overwhelmed with decisions, with information, with people's personal problems, with changing markets, with pandemics, with wars. It's very difficult for people. And carving out the time is very, very difficult. So they fall into groupthink, like you say, they fall into these things. And it's comfortable for them because they can make the decisions quickly. Yeah, and most decisions should be done with legacy processes, frameworks, and structures because they're not that they're not they're not that important. If you take the time to do sort of effortful cognition on the trivial and the unimportant, you become overwhelmed and it's too taxing on your team. But it's when you're making consequential, multi-stakeholder strategic decisions that if you revert to those old pathologies, if you allow those biases to uh, limit their way to see the possibilities, that's when you run into the most problems. So again, rules of thumbs, shortcuts, heuristics, process, those are all great. In the absence of those, we couldn't get much done. But it's when you do something that is highly consequential to your organization, like acquire another company, like think about the pricing of the product of something you're about to put into the marketplace. Think about competitor response if you have fast second movers who are gonna come up and try to overtake you. If you don't have the white space to think through some of these things, it'll be much worse when the problems emerge. You'll have a com more compressed time frame, and your options will actually diminish. So if you don't do this preventatively, if you don't take the time in advance, um, your ability to respond when things go poorly, and they will to some extent, um, you will have wished you did. So, but again, how do you get people to act preventatively? Gresham's law, daily operations, push out future planning. That's like, that's the most consistent thing I've learned in every organization. I'd love you to share Gresham's law. I learned that from your book. It's absolutely fantastic. And, and again, this is the type of stuff we should be taught in business school, <laughs> not just pouring information into our minds, but thinking how to think clearly, how to challenge our thinking, how to be open to that, open to, open to humility, to be able to go, there's a dissenting voice, well, listen to it. It's always value in the dissenting voice. Yeah, and I, you know, Micah Zenko is not going to be graded for his performance in 2023. We're all graded for what we do now. We're graded for what is measurable, not future performance. So we always discount the future and we do what is um, responsive, gives the appearance of hard work and thinking now, which tends to be answering emails. Because if we answer emails, we are interactive, somebody sees some thought was put into it. Um, and then I have meetings, so I just attend meetings. So I'm doing tasks that demonstrate to some extent impact and, uh, and activity. The problem is I'm not thinking about the future for which I'll deal with when I get to it. You have to have people who are different and incentivized to be future thinkers, to put on their forecasting hats, to carve out time and space to make those bets on the future. Because, you know, one of the most consistent things I hear from all leaders is like, I don't have time to think. I'm too busy. I have so many meetings you don't understand. And as I always tell them, there's an ideational basis behind everything you do. Whether you're sort of intentional about it or not, there is. There, there has a thought behind an action. Even if it was habitual and barely registered, there was. So again, when you are making consequential, novel, multi-stakeholder choices, judgments, decisions, that's when you have to pause. That's when you have to, the, the type one, type two thinking is, is, is really quite important. So, um, you know, for all those reasons, we, we are overwhelmed with the tyranny of the inbox and because it gives the appearance of activity, but it's the thing that makes it hard for us to actually step outside of ourselves and be critical thinkers. I'd love to share next how red teams function, but and also then we'll go into the different types of red teams because you gave me language for even why I do the show. And before we came on air, you were delighted to get information to other people. So they make better decisions in life. That's one of the things that drives you. Same here. And it's one of the reasons I provide this information. And I love the what you called it, you called it like alternative information to help people to make better decisions that they don't often hear that information. It's not mainstream. And for that very reason, you go and seek it out. So I wanted to thank you for that, because it was really, really useful. But let's get into how red teams function. Because here you say, ultimately, whether comprised of outside consultants or everyday employees, red teams help institutions in competitive environments, 
visualize themselves outside of daily routines, evaluate plans, identify institutional and strategic vulnerabilities and weaknesses, and potentially improve performance via three techniques, simulations, vulnerability probes, and uh, alternative analyses or information, as I just said there. Maybe we'll get into this and let our audience know how they function and about these three different techniques. Yeah, I mean, simulations are most commonly used in the cybersecurity world if you have a data breach, if you have um, notice of a ransomware attack, you have an incident response plan. That incident response plan is triggered. It takes into account uh, whether you pay cryptocurrency to get your, your information unencrypted and provided back to you, whether you're going to go out on the dark web and find whether people are trying to sell your information. Um, you also shut down your computers, you notify your customers, you probably notify local law enforcement, you at some point have to notify your regulator if you're in the United States. So there are all these steps you have to take. And the most important thing is having clear roles and responsibilities and moving with speed and care. One of the things you learn is that you don't build trust and you don't build relationships in crisis. Things get worse. The stress, the anxiety level only goes up. The information becomes even worse. So one of the things you typically do is you will test your incident response plan far in advance of the data breach of the ransomware notice. So when it actually hits, it's clear who's responsible for what. Because in the absence of that, what tends to happen at the C-suite level is you have a CISO, you have a CIO um, who is in charge for information security. There's a breach and the board or the CEO looks at the CIO and says, okay, what do we do? Well, there are decisions that involve other business units, that involve customers, that involve whether you provide information to law enforcement regulators, all of a sudden the general counsel wakes up and says, wait, maybe we don't do that right away. Um, if you're going to give money to criminals who are encrypted your data, did you have a, um, a wallet set up to send a you know, Bitcoin or Ethereum payment to them? And you know, so simulations are the first type. Um, and I'll just stop there because these are now being done more routinely. These in both in Europe and the United States, a lot of countries are mandated. Um, the degree to which they really evaluate the threats that are out there vary. Some of them sort of sleepwalk through the process, whereas others actually go through really rigorous, vivid and realistic simulations. But that's the first broader type of red team. And I'd love you to share maybe here, and I'm jumping ahead in the book, but the case study you share about Verizon and the fem to sell hackers. But also what in that I really understood was that variations of hacker, or so you have white hat, black hats, and also that many white hats are black hats in their hobbies because they're really interested in this world. And this world, as you describe it, is not that glamorous. It's like being a scribe in the medieval times. So maybe you'll bring us through this, both the, the, the what it's like to be a red or white, or, or white or black hat, what it's like then to, uh, the case study of Verizon and the Femme to Sell, that was absolutely brought it to life. And, and actually, one last thing that was really clear was, again, back to your point, is I'm not graded on avoiding possible disasters in the future. So I have to pull it out of my P&L today. And I'm also rewarded on my P&L today. And this is a huge dilemma for many leaders. Yeah, how do you demonstrate the utility of any preventative action? Right, that is always the biggest challenge. You could tell me, like, I go running, I should probably stretch or I might pull a muscle, but I might go running and never pull a muscle. So was stretching a waste of time? You know, who, who can necessarily say? And it's true with any with any of these sort of preventative alternative thinking and alternative processes thing. You know, the hacking world is I've spent a lot of time in this space over the last 10 years. And if you want to learn more, you just go on YouTube, Google DEF CON, Google Black Hat, watch some of the talks of really smart um, hardware, software hackers. But these, like hacking has this um, sort of mythical identity in popular culture, but it's really just taking a system and making it do something for which it was not intended. That's all hacking is. And so we use hacking as a shortcut for a lot of different things, but you know, there are typical grades of hackers. White hat hackers are the people who go out and identify vulnerabilities and responsibly disclose them or attempt to disclose them to the uh, either the company who created the process or a, a telecom company, they say, here's a vulnerability, here's how it's exploited, here's what you need to do to fix it. 
There are other black hat hackers, though, who go out and find these vulnerabilities, and their job is basically to go around and then sell them on the black market or to leverage them for criminal activities to get into a system or to use them to break into uh, otherwise secured or defended networks. The quick story I tell in the book is about um, Verizon has what's called a femto cell. A femto cell is like basically a small cell phone repeating tower. They're in all office buildings everywhere. If you live in a large apartment complex, they're probably there as well. Um, basically, these are things that allow a cell phone signal to be repeated where it otherwise would get blocked in front of the big towers. But it allows any, any phone that is processed through there, all the data to be basically captured. And these hackers had demonstrated, uh, these guys in New York who I got to know and I got to learn their story, they basically demonstrated how they could get root access to any femto cell, use that to reverse engineer a way back onto anyone's cell phone. And then once on the cell phone can jam, spoof, hack, do whatever they want in terms of messaging, receiving messaging, deleted them, et cetera. They told Verizon about this and they said in three months, we're gonna give a talk at DEF CON, which is the big hacking conference in Las Vegas. So you have three months to patch it, and then we're going to tell everyone about it. So they did it the right way. They basically identified a vulnerability. They proved that it existed. They then showed their homework to the Verizon people. And then they talked about, to brag about it, basically for the purposes of sort of saying we did this. And so some companies pay bounties for people who identify them, but some companies are really negligent in terms of receiving that information. So, you know, as I always say, every anything that is defended has vulnerabilities. There is no such thing as a, you know, lock-proof, air-gapped, whatever anyone wants to call thing. Everything has vulnerabilities that can and have been exploited by hackers. Hackers given enough time and money and effort break into anything. That's the, the simplest thing I've learned. Everything you think is secure is not. Um, so if you don't hire people to do it, somebody who is malicious will find it and exploit it in ways that don't make you comfortable. And it's interesting you say as well that, so you have, you have cyber hackers, so w working with non-physical space, but then you also have physical hackers who actually will hack into buildings. Some of the case studies you gave there just on a high level was really interesting. Some of the stats on the TSA, for example, were just mind boggling. Yeah, I mean, this is what's called physical penetration testing. And it's basically, you know, and I actually give the story, I, I opened that uh, chapter with the story of how I unintentionally physical pen tested a highly secure national security building by arranging an interview with an official. And it was literally like, the, I came to the desk, no one asked to see my ID. I was waiting in line. They called my name. I come to the front of the line. They then come to a, a desk where people are checked in. The person who had called my name said, this is Mike Zinko. He's here to meet so-and-so. They then gave me a badge that said screened. I went in an elevator with this person and within two minutes, I was sitting across the desk from National Security Pistol. I had never gone through metal detector. No one had ever verified my information, asked to see ID. I could have socially engineered this far in advance and done something completely terrible. People who do this for a living, and I give some really fun, amazing examples in the book, are ruthless and just totally unafraid. They break into everything. They take undertake false identities. But they do it, and this is most importantly, to identify where there are security shortcomings. The point is not to embarrass or humiliate the guard or the people watching the security cameras. The point is to identify specific shortcomings and vulnerabilities, which are then provided in an outbrief report with corrective remediating measures with time horizons and dollar signs next to them. So again, it's asking somebody to find security vulnerabilities before the bad guys do. And it's a completely uh, fascinating world if people are interested. I thought about the psychological aspect of that. So I'm, I'm a leader of an organization. I have a CIO. I don't really care about that stuff because I'm not measured on that. So I'm going, CIO, I trust you. Look after that stuff. See you later. I barely know their name. And, and that's, if, you're being, if we're being honest, that's what most large organizations are like. And then all of a sudden there's a hack and I'm going, what's the CIO's name? And I want to talk to them because it's like that, that you say, then there's egg on our face and I want to find out who rather than why. And I always think about the Toyota five whys here instead of the five who's to find out who's responsible. It's why did that happen? 
and let's fix that. We had a warning shot across our bow. Now it's time to repair it. And you talk about this when when it does happen, it's perceived as, oh, I need to cover up here and talk about it. It must have been a one off, etc. But there is no one offs. This is actually part of business today. Yeah, it's systemic. And, you know, the people who do these either cyber or physical penetration testing, they often hide the identity of um, the people who are responsible for how they get into the building or into the um, network, because anybody could be, they could get in anyway, right? They could get into the CEO's phone if they wanted to. You know, one of the most prominent, um, the one of the most expensive hacks ever, um, you can read about it, it's the Alcoa hack. Um, they were thinking about buying a Chinese company. And uh, Carlos Gosen, Carlos Gosen, who is famous for uh, being the gentleman who escaped jail in Toyota, part of the Renault um, uh, 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 auto executive world, he was on the board of Alcoa. He sent an email to every member of the board that said agenda. Every member of the board opened that document that had agenda. There was no agenda. It just downloaded malware onto every member of the board's um, emails. So. It can happen at the board level. It can happen at the front desk. It can happen anywhere. Um, the point, again, isn't to say, the point is to say we fail, right? And it's usually about security culture. It's rarely about individual performance. But we always like to look for individual scapegoats because it gives the appearance of having solved the problem rather than dealing with deeper seated culture issues, which are harder. We talked about vulnerability aspects there, but alternative analysis is really important because this for me, is so important for the work of innovation or transformation in organizations, getting people who are Andy Grove, the former CEO of Intel used to call them positive Cassandras, who are actually giving you information, because they're really interested in this information, seeking them out in your organization. But also you can create a red team version of those or a devil's advocate in an organization to disprove the information you have or to point out vulnerabilities as well. This is a huge important aspect of this book. Yeah, and not just my book, but if you want to learn more about this, Google um, Red Team, U.S. Army Red Team Handbook, which um, the last one came out a couple of years ago, but they have like nine volumes of this. You can learn some of these techniques in that handbook. These are basically facilitated exercises with groups of individuals, both affected by the process, product plan strategy, and some outsiders as well. And it teaches you how to do it, right? So you can go online and find out about it. But alternative analysis is based upon, like, again, the theory that the standard processes that information flows happen for judgments and decisions have all the biases, all the pathologies, um, especially like strong groupthink built into them. And it's really hard to see things differently. You know, you probably around on, on this uh, conversation knows uh, Irving Janus, who was the father of groupthink. Most of us, it's interesting, we mistakenly think groupthink is thinking alike. That's not what groupthink is. It's actually, it's worse than that. It's the illusion of unanimity. It's the illusion that we have a, uni a unified picture of what we're experiencing and what is the correct strategy, plan, process, et cetera. That illusion of unanimity forms over time because we can't see things differently. And no matter how diverse a team you have, based on all demographic experience, age, education, over time, we all start to think alike. We can't, we can't escape that. So alternative analysis is a way to, as I always describe it, it's just changing the frame through which groups make judgments or decisions. And the frame that you change depends on whether people are present biased, in which case you do future thinking. If you have low degrees of psychological safety, you might have to award people anonymity to express themselves. If this is a group with too much on their plate, you might have to force them to do prioritization activities. Um, you know, my, my favorite Michael Porter line, which is strategies deciding what not to do, like that's a huge part of this as well. So it's basically changing the frame. That's all alternative analysis. It's, it's a changed frame rather than going through the established processes. I find it so useful. And before I discovered your book, I'd found some of those exercises that run like, are, you know, are we on the bus to Abilene? <laughs> all those brilliant ways of thinking and just getting outside your own head. It's so, so valuable and really highly recommend Micah's book to bring them to life with all these fantastic explanations and examples. I'd love to share the six best practices because here you say 
bosses must recognize that there is a vulnerability within their organization that red teaming can help uncover and address. Organizations tend to be poor judges of their own performance and are often blind to shortcomings and pitfalls. We've definitely covered that. Indeed, in many instances, a readily apparent failure or disaster must have already occurred, resulting in meaningful human financial or reputational costs before a boss will be willingly listen to appeals for red teaming. This is the first of the best practices, which is the same for innovation. You need buy in from the top. Yeah, I, I mean, I, my professional life is mostly spent with C-suite, leader, C-suite leaders who are trying to think about overcoming sort of organizational shortcomings and thinking about risk. The number one way that I have learned C-suite leaders um, really think about risks is through peers, peer experience. If their own people tell them about a risk, they kind of diminish it or they think, well, we have a way to deal with it. But when a peer experiences harm or when a peer tells them about a harm they've um, uh, occurred that has occurred with an organization, they suddenly learn and they suddenly care. It's, 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 it's quite interesting. So most bosses, to your point, don't think they need these activities because again, they think they know what's going on in the organization or someone will tell them in another, in another organization. But if the boss doesn't signal the importance of alternative analysis or a red team, doesn't give them some space, some time, some resources to do it. And then most importantly, listen to the results, nothing else matters. So that's always the first best practice. The boss must buy in and it takes a brave and I would say um, almost honorable leader who is willing to allow people to tell him or her that what they think, what they're experiencing is not necessarily right. It's fantastic. And I wanted to just drag a line out of the brilliant chapter on this. You say, it's like any transformational or innovation project here, success hinges on the willingness and receptiveness, receptiveness of the leader. And like any innovation or trans innovation project, they you share the importance of this just because we see it so much in innovation, what we call sheep dip innovation, or just tick the box innovation, where somebody from the board, for example, has gone, oh, we need more innovation around here. So you hire a consultant to come in, do some innovation work, and you go tick, we did it. The same happens for red teaming as well. It's often employed as a cover your ass type experiment. Yeah, it's a, it is a check the box thing that allows somebody to tell a board or a risk committee that Oh, we red teamed that. We red teamed that the product pricing, this acquisition, and so forth. But unless you know what the red team actually did, that phrase is meaningless. And it's used as a cover for, um, again, it's used as a cover for them to not have to do evaluative thinking. It, it's like it places the burden upon other people. That is one of the challenges of a lot of red teaming is rather than the people who are responsible to rigorously review and think through either facilitation or a changed frame, the way that they're making a choice, they go, well, the red team did it for us. You know, it's sort of offshoring critical thinking onto others, but you don't know what that process was and you don't even know if they were ever listened to. So that is where red teaming can be used in a way that is uh, pretty pernicious. And I'm gonna fly through the, the six because I'm aware of your time as well. You're very, you guard your time very well as I, I would expect that you would. You say second, they need to be outside and objective by inside and aware. And I have a quote here that I'm going to skip in interest of time over to you for this one. Yeah, I mean, you want people who are aware of the product process plan or strategy being red team, but they can't be completely invested in it. It usually should be, I mean, the exercises we do can consist of a mix of people who are involved in development and then people who have no idea about it. They're literally read in at the last minute and it's interesting, in a lot of organizations, people say, well, these outsiders, they don't know. Like, they don't know the product, the process, the strategy. Their ignorance is actually a blessing. You know, the tyranny of expertise is a real thing. The people who are deeply immersed in a problem or coming up with a new strategy, they can't see it differently. So you need people who are overwhelming with information and data, as well as people who are outside. Um, but I've also learned that there's also a mix of hierarchy and experience. And some of the best red teamers are young enough, they don't know any better, old enough, they don't care anymore, right? It's, it's the people in the sweet middle who are protective about their career trajectories, 
who tend to be the least willing to see things and to say things differently. But it's people who are old, haven't given up on the organization and speak their minds. And I have a couple of examples in the book of some of the best ideas that come out of groups of people are almost inevitably from the youngest people in the room. Um, but unless you give them anonymity, they don't feel empowered to, to voice that, the, their, uh, their opinion. So you need a, a mix of people who do this uh, adequately. And, I, and this is why you see neurodiversity so important. One of the things that happened to me, Mike, is I, I joined the workforce quite late because I was a professional sports player until I was 31. So I came in as if I was a 21 year old, full of naivety. So I, I presumed a work environment was like a team that everybody pitched in and said what they thought, etc. And I remember working in a very legacy organization. And one of the senior leaders grabbed me aside and he goes, Look, kid, you have potential to move up the ranks here. But you learn you need to learn politics and how things really work. I left soon afterwards <laughs> after that conversation, because I discovered he, he was right. But I wanted to say that to say, you talk about the characteristics of these red teamers, you say that they are fearless skeptics with finesse. They tend to be loners, mavericks, good storytellers, they lack self -cen censorship, which is a really important one. And they're not climbers to your point there. These are some of the reasons why they think and act differently. And these are vital skills for a red teamer. Yeah, it's funny, I was actually talking to a friend of mine who's a a CISO at a healthcare provider recently. He's a background as a long hacker. Now he's information security chief. And I was asking, I said, like, what makes a really good hacker? And he thought about it. He said, every good hacker I know had some foundational outsider experiencing outsider experience when they were younger. That outsider experience like never leaves you if you've ever gone through one of them. It always makes you feel on the margins or the edge of groups. And it's at those margins or edge when you're not as heavily influenced by the culture, the pressure, the norms, the rituals, that those are the people who can see things at, in, in a different light. Um, these are also people who usually have experienced tremendous failures, either personally or professionally, so they know what failure gets like. They're the ones who are willing to say, you think things are bad, they can get really bad. Like These are also the people, though, who have come through them. So these are the ones who can say, yes, things are bad now, but you know, as you get older, um, the bad and the good sort of all blend into one uh, flat line. So you need it, you need that that sort of mix of people. The last thing I'll say, there are some people who just can't do this. There are some people who are like inherently incapable of providing new ideas and insights in a way that doesn't come off as toxic, obnoxious or almost defamatory. These are the people who say like, you are idiots. You have no idea what you're doing. Um, you, I can't believe you are, you are still leaders in this company. Like these are people, the whole point of red teaming is to improve an organization, period. And if your job is to make people feel bad or to humiliate them in some way or another, nobody's gonna listen to you. And you're not gonna have a probably a long job anyway. So you have to be invested in the mission but not being captured by all of the culture, the pathologies that go with it. It's a great point. And actually, I find people who work in innovation, red teams, if you want to call them that, there's, they're, they're we thinkers. It's not to advance personally, they actually have a real drive to help the organization and help the people even keep their jobs because there won't be any organization in the future. We did an episode recently, Micah, with uh, Art Kleiner, Kleiner on his book, the age of heretics. And we zoomed in on Pierre Vock, who created the whole idea of scenario planning, as you know, well, and he said to your point there, that the best way to make a C suite executive have a new thought is give them information to create the aha moment in their head. And that's what that key point you said about that is, it's not I need to be a great storyteller, and I need to have finesse to be able to almost facilitate that or create the environment for those thoughts to happen, and then take no responsibility for those thoughts happening. Like so you're like a catalyst, you burn up in the into the transaction of making somebody other have a breakthrough moment. But that brings us nicely to the fourth, uh, fourth aspect or characteristic, which is to have a really broad bag of tricks. And the great D Hawk, who's the founder of Visa, 
he was a guest on our show, we did a seven part series with, a, with us. He said reading eclectically as a leader is one of the most valuable skills that you can have because you get a broad range of tricks, as you said. And this is a key component and a key characteristic for a red teamer. Yeah, you know, Jeff Bezos has the line I use a lot, which is, he says, the internet is a confirmation bias machine. And that's very true. Most of us, you know, if you're old enough to remember before the internet, this is for old people, you had to go to a library in the basement and look at microfiche or newspapers. You had to go find books, um, physical books, even. Now all the information in the world is like at our fingertips. It's amazing. And we take no advantage of it. The average person looks at 10 to 12 websites every day. They look at the same 10 to 12 websites. They actually look at them in the same order, right? So of all the information you could have, we are actually, um, our biases, the way we think about things is just, we actually make it more cemented, more calcified over time. Um, the way that you see problems differently is by initiating outsider conversations. It's by, you get adjacent. This is a big part of my research now is about creativity. And I have this concept of what's called adjacencies. Adjacencies are getting outside of your problem set to perceive it differently. When you were sit at your desk, you don't solve it. It's when you go for a walk. It's when you're somewhere else. Talking to the same people you talk to every day, you don't see it differently. It's talking to outsiders, right? It's like, and how do you get adjacent um, to perceive things differently is really hard. And so I, I think this is one of the one of the biggest issues about, about, about changing the way we see things. And that bag of tricks comes over time. It's not something you can get very easy. Like people always ask me, like, what's the blueprint for red teaming? Is there like an IKEA assembly guide? There is. But it's really about the relationship you build with your point of contacts with the organization to make things better. And that, that requires um, some steeping, some time, some cultural immersion, because if you just follow the bag of tricks or the blueprint in a way that is false or inauthentic to the organization, it gets resisted very strongly. Um, so you know, you both have to have the bag of tricks, but also the sensitivity and the care to apply it correctly. Even Amazon's designed that way. People who bought this book buy this book, go a totally different direction. And you'll you'll actually be a unique thinker. I think that's the point many people miss. My, my sons were given out last night because one of them had homework and the other didn't. And I was like to the guy who didn't, I was like, this is your opportunity to break out from the flock and learn something different. He's like, looking at me, he's like, that's not how it works, Dad. <laughs> and I go on to point five because I'd love to finish the characteristics. This is be willing to hear bad news and act on it. And this is, happens so much in sheep dip innovation as well, Micah, where you say here that one way that firms often avoid or minimize bad news is to game or cook the system or the results. And the same happens with innovation work. You go in there, maybe you do a workshop with a team. They go tick, as you said earlier on, check the box, innovation done. But this one's different. This is when something's uncovered, but they don't do anything about it. Again, because why would I if I'm not measured on that? And that, that means also the board need to change how they react towards a leader. Yeah, I mean, I've, you know, I was thinking recently did a uh, Fortune 100 technology company, a two-day sort of series of structured facilitated red team exercises where they were thinking about making, let's just say a very consequential decision that had a lot of support at the highest levels was a big part of their future plans and so forth. Um, there had been some rumblings and some challenges about certain aspects of the validity and essentially the um, ability of this to make money over time. It had to deal with a piece of technology and whether that would be eroded at, um, by competitors in a very short period of time. We, through a series of exercises, not just challenged the assumptions that underlied the board and powerful people in the company thinking about it, we sort of got into why they actually believe this. And it was, they needed a positive story to tell the street and to tell themselves to essentially save their jobs. And they were going to do everything to make this product a reality. They were not going to resist it anyway. You know, we did the exercises, we documented their findings, we presented them in an outbrief report in written and verbal form, we told them like, this is what your team says is the unfortunate probable outcomes. And they just took it and they said, thank you. And they did nothing with it. And needless to say, 
um, a lot of the things they warned about in this group ended up happening. The worst news is not just that it, this product and the strategy this company took a back, it took a downturn. It's that the people who went through the process realized that their voices really weren't welcome. And they never forget that. Like I've talked to some of them since then. And that's actually worse than um, having a bad strategy for company. Like you can recover from that. But if you create a culture where people feel um, not included, they feel like unheard, and this is a place where dissenting and challenging viewpoints aren't welcome, like they leave with their feet or they detach, even worse, they stay and they detach. So not listening to bad news is a terrible signal to send to a company. So I always tell every boss, every leader I talk to, don't do this unless you're willing to acknowledge the results. You might not always act on exactly what they recommend, but you have to acknowledge your seat in a public way, thank them for what you've heard. And if you're not gonna act on it, say why, period. If you're not willing to do that, like let's not do work for you. It's so important, Micah, and, and it's why I love sharing this work and this alternative analysis is, it can be mentally challenging for people as well. I was in one of those organizations and I was told by my boss, stop speaking up, sit at your desk. And I was like, what do you want me to do? And he's like, just don't be meeting people and innovating across the organization. And I, I was like, well, boy, I couldn't do it. But the, to your point, I looked around me and I saw these people and I was like, that must have happened to so many of those people around me as well. And they put their brain in their drawer and they basically gradually die at a very slow pace, at least mentally anyway. It's so sad to see in organizations. But the sixth characteristic, we'll just have time to squeeze this one in, is red team just enough but no more. Red teaming can be a stressful and demoralizing activity if it is done too often which in turn can be irreparably disruptive to an institution's strategies and plans. And as you said earlier on, you don't want to overdo this because you have work to do, but you need to do it on a regular enough cadence in order to be effective. Yeah. And so, I mean, we talked about the vulnerability probes and the simulations earlier. How often should you test the network security of your computer system and your organization? If you tested it all the time, that's all your people would be doing, would be responding to the vulnerabilities they identified. And they couldn't even build out a system, you couldn't do digital transformation, you'd be just stuck in a rut. Similarly, how often should you critically review your strategy? If you did it every month, that's all you'd be doing is preparing and then responding to the red team results of your, your sort of evaluation and your pressure testing of your strategy, it'd be exhausting. So you have to find the sweet spot where you have enough data and information to see if your strategy is working, if your building or your network is secure, if your product is going to be successful before you do that critical review. Um, but if you wait too long, you become complacent, right? You assume it's working. You're not really interested. You've got a lot of other things going on. Um, so it depends a lot on your competitive environment. It depends on your innovation, your product cycle, your go-to-market strategies. Like That tells you how frequently you should do it. Um, and it's different for every organization. Man, I have so many more notes here that I won't get through, but it's been an absolute pleasure. I, I want to ask you one more question, and I'm going to let you think about this one because I, I pulled so many quotes that I love, but I usually finish a show pulling a quote that I absolutely love, and I'm going to share that. While I'm doing that, I'd love you to think about a message for A, the red teamers in organizations, those mavericks in organizations, and B, the leaders of organizations in this world that is incomplete in information and more complex than ever before. And before I even go there, before I give the quote, where can people find you, Micah, to find out for consultation, keynotes, and of course, to find the book? Yeah, easily enough. I, I work at the McChrystal Group. I'm the director of research and learning. I have the really distinct privilege of doing amazingly cool and powerful virtual and in-person red team exercises, strategy reviews, uh, cybersecurity simulations. Um, and so McChrystal Group, I'm easy to find there. Easy to find on LinkedIn, McChrystal Group, uh, Twitter, um, or, or LinkedIn, uh, Mike Ozenko, Twitter, Mike Ozenko, um, easily enough. Um, and then, you know, to answer your question, it's really interesting. Red teamers themselves, they usually don't um, live in that role forever. 
because over time it becomes really hard to do it. And if you're a really serious, aggressive red teamer, you can start to lose touch with the day-to-day experiences of people who are just doing normal tasks, routines, and operations. Um, and in the intelligence community, in the U.S. intelligence community and the U.S. military, you actually do cycles. You'll do a two-year turn on a staff red team, or you'll do a two-year year turn in alternative analysis, and then you go back to your, to your regular job. Um, but I think that in normal organizations, and especially most businesses, that's not kind of the way it works. You still have the people who have are preternaturally designed to be this sort of person. And then you have other people who aren't. But, you know, I always tell people who have this identity and want to be this sort of person, it really depends on how you do it. The way that you can be a successful red teamer over time is um, do it in a way that is productive, is pro-social, is aligned with the mission and values of the organization, and is intended to be helpful and in overall improving. It is not designed to show off that you're smart. It is not designed to show off that other people are wrong. It is designed that we are better as an organization. Um, that's why I'd say the red teamers, and then to the leaders, you know, you have reached a level of great power and authority and agency. With that comes tremendous responsibility. Um, most leaders ascend to their position simply through time. They're at an organization that is somewhat successful. They get to this level and then this level and this level. They rarely get leadership training or management training or critical thinking training to really improve their leadership skills. They just become leaders by dint of age. Um, You know, I always tell leaders like that, you have to give yourself and your teams the time to step outside of all of the pressures you're experiencing, to have that white space, whether that's virtual carved out time some strategy offsite, some individual time for self-reflection, because um, in the absence of it, you won't be doing it. Task saturation is a real thing. It makes it hard for us to see things differently. But the fundamental and the most important way to be creative and innovation in life isn't to suddenly have some spark that makes you different. It's to suppress your habitual thinking. And the act of suppressing habitual thinking literally requires intentionality and focus. So give yourself the time and the space to do that. Give your teams the time and the space to do that. You will like what you hear. There will be insights that otherwise remain hidden to you and the rest of the organization that can be valuable. So don't be afraid to undertake this. It's not a touchy-feely, nice-to-do thing. It's actually important for them and for you. I'm not going to give a quote because you absolutely nailed it, man. That was brilliant. Author of Red Team how to succeed by thinking like the enemy. Mike Ozenko, it was an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aiden. I loved it. I told you that was going to be such a great episode with Mike Ozenko. Absolutely love his writing. I love his shows on YouTube. You can see him on some panels, etc. on YouTube. Absolutely brilliant speaker, great thinker, and a great purpose, which is to bring you information to help you make the best decisions possible. Speaking of bringing you information to make the best decisions possible, this show is brought to you by Zai. Zai is boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded finance products and services, empowering businesses to manage multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease. You can check out Zai at hellozai.com.